Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on building an end-to-end -end data and AI platform by using BigQuery and Generative AI. In the call today with me, I have my colleagues, uh, Adam, Naujot, Luis, and we have been working together to create this environment to showcase how you can build a real system like that. And Skander, who is not on the call as well, who have been part of this uh, too. But with that, let's look at the agenda. Uh, first, we'll start with the foundations. Uh, we'll do an introduction on how things works uh, within uh, within the you know our ecosystem. Then we'll talk around the uh, what we mean by the data beans environment, which is our data environment. Uh, and uh, my colleagues then take it through how this has been uh, made as well, right? Which is I think one of the important parts. So bear with us. So it will take uh, you know around fifteen uh, to minutes to get to the demo uh, because we'd like to show you what really uh, powers the system up as well, right? Uh, so everyone is really talking around leveraging AI. Everyone is talking really getting more from their data, right? Uh, and it is also with the era that we, we are in whereby there's lots of focus on using AI and particularly generative AI tools to uplift the users as well is one of the keys we are saying. How can you understand actions? How can you improve efficiency? But what we are also saying is the traditional uh, environments doesn't really need uh, meet the needs of the AI era, right? Again, based on another you know, study, only very few can uh, leverage that. Why is that? Because there are challenges around bringing structured data and unstructured data because they live in different systems. Also, I, I, I'm sure that you would also find this in your organization. There are lots of barriers in terms of accessing the data. You have to go through lots of hoops and such. The data product thinking hasn't really penetrated in many places. And one of the biggest challenges, and this really gives you the challenges and headaches around the governance as well, when you move, when you have a lot of systems around, you have to move the data, you have to open the security, you have to, you know, uh, feel the impact of uh, cost of these systems as well. And this increases the compliance risks and everything. The, you know, and then I, I, I talk around this a lot, actually. So, uh, and if you have seen one of my other talks as well, the data warehouse have been around for a long time. They've been around for over four decades, you know, uh, and they have, they work really, really well. They really focused on, you know, having a single access type, having a SQL access on structured and semi-structured data, but answering the, you know, uh, what has happened in the past. With the Hadoop era, the data lakes came, right? So it is, funnily enough, uh, all filled by the Google file system, uh, you know, and then that's where Had how the Hadoop really became the thing effectively. And with the ability to store a lot more data, we also expanded that we focused on, you know, answering what is happening now as well. It also broadened the, the, some of the, you know, the data that uh, was accessed, right? So not just the structured data, but some unstructured data, not all unstructured data also became part of this, as well as that the new programming languages came to our life, right? It wasn't just a SQL, but there's also new, you know, languages became, uh, you know, the mainstream as well. But BigQuery, which is really the environment that we, you know, use here in Google Cloud, gives you the ability of, you know, what can you do in the past now, but also it helps you to answer what is going to happen in the future as well, right? And this is where the AI comes in. Also, the, the data sets, the, the data that you access to, whether it is unstructured, semi-structured, structured data, you can now access that through whether you are using a programming language or even you are using nature language to access them. And this is really one of the key, key aspects of being success as well. You are uplifting your users, and I'll talk around that a little bit more, but you are also broadening the data that you are accessing to. Imagine that you might have some image data, which 
you know, you can process, you can you can have the full multimodality as an input to your environment, as well as the data available that to serve. And it can you can represent this as vectors and directly have access from somewhere like BigQuery, for example. The, the goal is really how you can bring your enterprise knowledge together with what the, you know, the AI platforms is giving to you. How can you do predict, extract, and generate uh, information, right? It is the key. This is what we are all trying to do. But it isn't just, you know, just going in front of your machine, opening one of the uh, tools that generates a lot of things for you and generates some images. Well, we know that the business environment doesn't just work like that, right? It has to add some value. How can you do that? You can only add that value by bringing the structured data, the information that you have within your enterprise environment and merging that. And the barriers between the data and AI slows innovation as well. It creates more data silos. And I'll talk to, around this a little bit more in a, in a minute. But effectively, you have, you know, traditionally, you have the data science teams, you have data engineering teams, data analyst teams. All of them are doing something, but in their own environments. It is often that you see that the copy of the data is taken out from the data warehouse. You don't know what version, you don't know when that has been done. Then the ML model is built on top of that. You lose track of what happened to that data, right? And you also, you know, have to manage all of that as well. How can you, you know, break that barrier, right? How can you create the cycle? And how can you see more models going into production as a result as well? We provide this end-to-end -end environment for your data. We have BigQuery environment for your uh, AI. We have Vertex and uh, for Insights, we have Looker, which is really powered uh, through the infrastructure that is provided through Google Cloud environment too, right? So what happens is the BigQuery gives you the powerful uh, data platform that accesses all types of data, any type of storage, and you can use that. And then the Vertex AI gives you the models and APIs, whether they're you know, open source or, or supplied from Google, whether they're open models or not, right? Or whether you are customizing your models yourselves uh, using, again, either Google or open source models, or whether you are calling some sort of an API. And these are some of the things that we are going to demonstrate to you today, how this really becomes the reality, right? And doing this, really gives you the true democratization. Everyone really becomes part of the data and AI ecosystem. It uplifts the users. It increases the collaboration. It also makes sure that you are governed properly as well while you are scaling. And scaling in terms of the systems that you have, but also scaling in terms of the applications as well. Right? It is all about making data and AI a team sport. And this is what I mentioned at the beginning, and I would like to deep dive a little bit more here. You often find in the organizations that, that if you look at the, you know, the top bit of the screen here, right, you have uh, your data analysts and data engineers who traditionally focus on collecting data, transforming that, integrating that, right, doing some analysis and visualizing as well. But these days, like so BigQuery ML, allows the users to go further, right? They can look into the which model that they can use and they can go and you know, do some predictions through that model as well without needing to talk to the data science and ML engineers, right? Uh, and one example, you know, one of our uh, customers, this is also on you know, our YouTube channel as well. They presented at the last next event. Uh, so what they do is, they use the data that they have from the enterprise side. What they do, they look into the unstructured data, which is the communication uh, with their customers, all the transcripts, which also have the logs in that. The data team goes and looks into the entities within that, and they are asked to provide all the cities that their customers are coming from, right? They can do it as well, just directly from, you know, a BigQuery, just using BigQuery ML. Then further, they go and generate an email by using the information that they have there in the data warehouse, their customer information, right? Through SQL and, you know, send it off. On the flip side, at the bottom, the green bit, 
is what the data scientists and data engineers, um, ML engineers do. They do the, you know, future engineering, training models, deploying models. They go and evaluate and, you know, they go into the cycle, right? That's how you do ML. You should really experiment a lot and then go back in the cycle and test what features are waiting and working for you and such. And then you serve the models. But they're also part of the data engineering process now and the data discovery part of it as well. How about if they can look where the data has been propagating from, right? Using things like Dataplex, they're looking into the lineage of the data or looking into the quality of the data directly as well, rather than having to ask the data engineering team to provide for them. And then by doing this, you really bridge the gap, but also unlock your teams to focus on their core tasks as well. And then the, you know, it really gives you the ability of having an end-to-end -end data and AI ecosystem gives you that you can bring the unstructured and structured data together. You can bring data and AI teams together, right? But you really need to have the right foundations from the beginning to facilitate that. In fact, this is the core theme today, and that's what we'll show. BigQuery is at the heart of everything that we do here. It provides a true serverless environment where storage and compute is, you know, uh, totally separated, right? And with Big Lake, you can get access to data, whether it is residing on open source formats, whether it is structured and unstructured, right? Or whether it is managed to BigQuery. And your IAM rules and everything goes through there. And the game really becomes, right, effectively, what tools are most useful for you for the tasks that you are doing and then what you are most comfortable with. And the governance comes on top of that across all of these. And our architecture really allows you to do, you know, the real-time side of things. You can bring the data in and we have written this as a, you know, as a paper as well. You can go to the link on the, uh, on the slide that I'm showing to you as well. But also you can go and expand that with the generative AI use cases, right? And then you can have uh, advanced models like Gemini directly within the environment, helping you to develop this, right? Assisting you, but also you are using it, you know, at the core, as well as the open source models to build things. Again, you don't need to use 10 different frameworks to do this. You can do all your, you bridge your data ops and ML ops together while it's doing that as well. And then the Vertex AI platform provides that. Uh, and I want to, you know, speed up a little bit because I want to show you how this works, right? And when you look at it, coming back into the same, uh, you know, discussion here, and this is a more detailed view, imagine that you have the development environment, which is BigQuery Studio, right? That you develop your SQL, but at the same place, you also write your Python code and you also, you know, do your, uh, lineage, and you also do some of your visualizations. Imagine that on the other side, the ML team uses the same environment to call up uh, enterprise, right? And then they can share the code and they can work together. This is exactly what allows you to build things properly. It simplifies the you know the data and AI journey effectively with BigQuery and AI. So one of the things that happens, and apologies, the left bit, uh, the, the simulation, I, it didn't load properly. Uh, but you can really do three things, right? So you can call APIs. You can, uh, you know, do AutoML or BigQuery ML type stuff at the, in the middle, right? And you can also build your own models and train your own models. I expect that majority of the users to be in the middle of this, right? It allows you to effectively right, whatever user that you are, to become part of the, you know, uh, machine learning uh, cycle, right? And this is really important, whether it's predictive AI or generative AI. And let me show you, you know, what we built as part of this as well. We wanted to create an environment whereby, you know, it resonates with, you know, different uh, folks, right? And we started, and, and my colleagues will talk around this, so I'm not going to spend much time. But imagine that you have a true multimodal input, right? You bring an ERD diagram or UML diagram, 
directly as an input to your environment. And you use this, right, that to generate all the schema as well as also maintaining your primary key and foreign key relationships. Imagine that you also generate all of your data, code, and as well as, you know, data in different modalities directly within your enterprise data platform, calling your Vertex AI environment as well. And on top of that, you can also go and look into and up into the insights. Rather than you doing that, the algorithms allows you to generative AI, allows you to do that. And that's exactly what we built, right? And it gives you the you know, innovation through that. The architecture looks like this, but I'd like to start showing you uh, the demo and I'll bring that screen up. Uh, so I think you can see it, perfect. So uh, imagine that you know you are in London, everything that you see on the screen here, apart from the maps, is generated, right? So it is phenomenal, all the information, including the insights. What I can do is I can go and look into the insights because it is telling me that by looking into the data that I have in my data warehouse, it is my, you know, uh, my LLMs are telling me that, oh, there's something happening here. So you should focus on as, as you do as a, you know, as your company. Again, the map site is, you know, we are calling the, you know, uh, the maps API here, right? But you can see there are a number of things. I have my data residing in BigQuery, the, my weather data. I have my product information. I also have my, you know, customer information as well. Also, I have my tracks going in the, you know, around the city too, right? And it, I can go and use the dial here and I can look into what's happening in the, in the future, right? It tells me that there's a game happening, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in London. Or I can go back and look into what has happened in the past, right? And it looks into what has happened there and it also calculates the opportunity. And one thing that I would like to show uh, before handing over to my colleague now, Joe, to show you how this also works and, you know, uh, as an operational uh, report is I have a blinking icon here. I'll go and click on that. And it tells me that based on the current sales trend, it is suggested to run a promotional campaign for happy hours. It is asking me to launch a campaign. Well, let's do that. I click on that and it goes and generates me, you know, an email, generates me an image, right? Looks into my data, defines my audience, right? And I can go and fire off an email to do that. And with that, I would like to pass over to Navjot, who will show you how this also comes up in uh, look at as well, right? And then, then he'll hand over to Adam and uh, Luis, who will show you how this works behind the scenes. Thank you, Pirat. Uh, so as Pirat showed a little bit on like how you can fire off a campaign and how you can check the opportunities. With this data beans, we have also integrated a, a, a looker uh, to do traditional BI and maybe go beyond traditional BI. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna click on launch operational report. As soon as I click, you see, we have looker embedded inside this application so you see the seamless experience of going from your your portal into a bi application which is in-app embedding so in this uh, application you see a uh, looker dashboard which on the top has a business snapshot of the of the business of data beans you have single values you have bar chart with some historical data as well as some forecast you have a product insight but like all the menu items uh, um, uh, related to data beans, uh, running all of the trucks. And then we also have a customer sentiment and loyalty uh, presented in, in um, line charts. So I can look at the dashboard, get the inside, but what I cannot get is like the, the insights buried underneath this dashboard. And for that, that's where Gen AI comes into picture. Using Gen AI, uh, we can generate the insights out of this dashboard. So as soon as I click on this, uh, generate we are sending the data from each of the tile uh, to llms to get the insights back so if you see here uh, the insights from the each uh, tile started flowing in um, so if you see one of the one of the single value was total number of customers there are like ten thousand 
and 600 customers uh, in the most recent month with 5.7 million of revenue with the average lifetime value of $68. So it is not just giving you the summary of, uh, of each of the tire, it is also giving you some of the next steps you can take. We're talking about uh, customers so how and then lifetime value. How can you increase the customer lifetime value? You can run target promotion. You can put personalized offers or, or analyze the behavior of the customers or implement a customer relationship uh, management strategies to, to enhance your business. So, I'll, so we are integrating business intelligence and calling Chen AI to go beyond what's uh, presented in a dashboard. Uh, so that's the already built dashboard, right? What if I, I've, I don't have information and, um, which I want is not presented in this dashboard? We have also um, integrated a Gen AI to directly explore the data and get the visualization. For an example, we have this chat experience on the side where you can put a prompt on. As soon as you put a prompt on, you click on send. We are calling Gen AI to generate the Looker Explorer. If you are aware of Looker Explorer, generally you do drag and drop or, or, or select fields. But with this Gen AI integration, we are able to get to the visualizations or the insights uh, using the language we ever, everyone knows English. Uh, so for an example, in this, I'm, I'm uh, getting the top 10 location sales in last six months as a waterfall. Uh, the um, other uh, could be, what are the total sale in the last six months broken by date? So as soon as I fire off, it's going to generate that visualization. So it's a kind of a, a natural language to visualization experience. Uh, so we, we wanted to give a quick overview. Uh, like how we are integrating Gen AI uh, to go beyond uh, uh, just business intelligence and uh, and the dashboard you see. With that, I'll hand it over to um, Adam to talk about uh, some of the um, things we are doing with the data beans and and so some of the back end. Awesome. Thank you, Natya. So I'm going to go ahead and go through a couple slides, but we're going to jump through some of the uh, code that was used out to build this. So the first thing is we took a Gen AI first approach for everything. So everything you see in the uh, data beans has been synthetically generated by Gen AI. All the data, all the images were generated. And also we used it to generate our internal documentation. So let's uh, jump into a few areas. We'll look at the demo a little bit, but we're going to jump into the marketing campaign. So when Frat clicked here and did this generated AI insight and launched this campaign, we went through these steps to generate that. So we have a prompt generation process, and we use some techniques from DeepMind where we use LLMs to generate our prompts. So we have LLMs authoring our LLM prompts so we can scale our ability to generate these marketing campaigns and produce really uh, great images. We also get through some quality control processes. I'm not going to read these, but we'll go through the actual notebook. And then we end up with the HTML that's displayed directly in the application. So the first thing we do is we start with a basic uh, handwritten prompt. And we get mocha pancakes with vanilla ice cream. And we get a image. And we're looking at the ability to do some brainstorming and possibly improve the prompt so we can get better looking images. So the first thing we do is use some techniques where we're going to use Gemini to brainstorm and create some mutated prompts. And here, what we do is we create 10 additional prompts, and then we use these to generate our images. So instead of just using relying on a hand-authored prompt, we want to use the creativity of our LLM to generate additional prompts. And you can see we get images of all types of varieties where they have um, sort of more creative, more descriptive and the, uh, the way the ice cream's on it, the, the syrup. Um, so it has the ability to create a prompt that's uh, a lot more creative, which results in a better looking picture. And also I generated something uh, out of the, uh, just a data beans truck, which is not representative of what we wanted because we want to do some quality control checks on this. So I purposely put a, a coffee truck in, in the list and now what we want to do is verify that each image contains what we asked for. So LLMs, since we generated a variety of creative prompts, we don't want it to get too creative. And what I do is I go through 
and I ask for verification. Does this each one of these images contain what I was asking for? In this case, uh, milk of pancakes and the coffee truck with disco lights. It doesn't contain any food items. So we can narrow down our brainstorming by using an LLM. In this case, we use Gemini Pro Vision to take a look at our images and explain to us if it contains the food items we are generating our marketing campaign for. The next thing we can do with Gemini Pro Vision is ask for a rating. So now that we've eliminated uh, images that might not represent what our campaign is for, we go ahead and pass all these images along with a prompt, and we're going to ask for Gemini Pro Vision to rate this. So we're going to say, which one looks the tastiest? And after that process, it picked this one as the highest rated image, and then you compare this to our original image. So the highest rated one has more syrup, um, has some uh, java beans around it, and some background pieces. And this one is our original image. So we're going to go ahead and use our generated image. But first, we're going to generate our marketing text. So Data Beans is in several different cities. It's in New York, London, San Francisco, and Tokyo. So we want to go ahead and create our marketing message in all four cities, and we want to make sure it's in the local language. So we go ahead and generate our marketing message with our LLM, and you can see it authors each of our uh, marketing campaigns in the local language. And then finally, we need to create an HTML or format this for uh, X or Instagram. So we ask our LLM to create the HTML for us. And we also put a placeholder in here um, so we can embed our image directly into the HTML. So the resulting HTML produced looks like this. And that's what you see within our application. So in the end, we can generate this for the various cities. And then the results are saved within BigQuery. And we also save the images in GCS or Google Cloud Storage. So the pipeline can be automated to run nightly and to scale this. Um, so it's very good at doing our quality control checks, making sure we're generating something that could be used straight out of the box. Oops. So here's sort of like the image, the prompt thing we do. We have a, a, maybe a handcrafted prompt. And then we use some prompt reader techniques from DeepMind, and we'll generate uh, more uh, verbose uh, prompts that produce uh, more vivid looking images. And you can see some of the results here. So some learnings. Um, when we did this, we have some learnings as, uh, as we did this exercise. We really used our LLM to do a lot of brainstorming. It's very creative. It can create you know, results that you might not typically even think of. So it's a great way to do some brainstorming exercises and to get really spectacular results. The quality checks that you saw were very important. We want to make sure we don't generate something too abstract. We want to make sure it represents what we're actually marketing. So it's really important to have those quality checks. And then we can use things like Gemini Pro Vision can, you know, to a virtual taste test, and we can make sure that it has uh, ex explanations as about its thought process. And then you saw it's in a local language, and if you don't know HTML, the LLM can correctly generate that for you. So the next piece I'd like to go through is the events. So as we uh, go through uh, the various, uh, as we scroll here and see the various routes, so these events are also all Gen AI insights. So we won't jump into any code, but we'll go through sort of the process and the mindset. So we're able to get Google event data directly from Google events, and that downloads the each city's data for that day. We then store that within BigQuery, and then we can query that as JSON, and we can take that data and inject it right into our prompt. So LLMs have been trained on a large data set, but that doesn't mean they have the latest up-to-date data because after they're done training, it takes a while to get them deployed, and then they basically don't have up-to-the-minute data. So what we do is we inject our current events into the LLM. So now the LLM has the latest data. We ask for this to be processed. We'll process this directly within BigQuery, so I can show you what that looks like. If we jump over to the event table here, the prompts are actually, um, we store them directly within BigQuery, which lets us use a SQL statement to uh, inference these in batches, and then we can actually save the results uh, in a separate field. 
So we want to preserve our prompts because potentially we might want to rerun these. So we go ahead and save those prompts in the table so you can run this at scale. And everything is stored uh, within BigQuery and then any images we put on our storage system. So LLMs are great for unstructured data. Here you can see um, some results. But we basically, the Google events data is from a web page. It's very unstructured. We get an event venue. We get some times that event dates that aren't formatted as a machine readable date. And we get a description. So by passing this, we can ask the LLM, uh, you know, pick events that will be highly profitable. We can inject our, our past knowledge about certain events, and then we can get the LLM's reasoning. It can also look up the event's latitude and longitude. So it's very good at uh, figuring out just by the event venue, the exact GPS coordinates so we can route our trucks. It can turn that event, human, uh, the human readable string, the date string, into a machine string. And then it's able to infer things like if they're family or holiday events, and if they'll draw bigger or smaller crowds. So uh, great use to basically get a lot of uh, unstructured data processed into some uh, very meaningful insights. The last piece is just uh, talking about our synthetic data generation. So since we started DataBeans with nothing, we had no tables, we had no data. Um, it's hard to get good data, it's hard to get uh, you know, to forward engineer everything. So we took an approach by using Gen AI first, and we did our data engineering all with uh, Gen AI. We would forward engineer ERD, and I'll show you what that looks like. We would brainstorm to get creative new coffee names, um, locations, so we could know where the best places to place our trucks at, and also to route the trucks. So all the routing, all the menus, and everything you see in the demo was generated synthetically with our Gen AI processes. And we also can generate Python code when we need to generate large scale tables. So if we have tables that have millions of rows in it, instead of calling the LLM directly 1 million times, we have the LLM author, uh, in this case, Python code, which gets deployed in a scalable fashion. And then we can call that and generate data at scale. So if we look at the table, uh, we're going to take a quick look at the menu table. Uh, we have our ability, the LLM has ability to know that small, medium, and large sizes should be priced accordingly. It generates the name of the item, it generates a description, and it also generates the image prompt. So uh, what we'll do is instead of having to go back and create a bunch of prompts to generate each image of our menu, we actually have the LLM generate each of the prompts, which is then generated for us. So very good technique to scale your processing, and we store all that information within BigQuery. So some learnings here was, um, you know, realistic data. Um, it can speed up your data engineering process. It can take ERDs, which I'll show you the notebook real quick. So within our notebook, we actually download a picture of our ERD, and we put and we pass this over to Gemini Pro Vision. And I'll show you that in a second. So Gemini ProVision can actually forward engineer ERDs, class diagrams. So we took a different take on our data engineering processes to sort of optimize our development process. Um, the other piece is foreign keys. We need realistic foreign keys. So realistic foreign keys are generated as part of our, our synthetic data generation. And it, the LLM is uh, smart enough to increment our primary keys when we're using integers. So these are the results of our, our menu item. But again, everything in the application here has been synthetically generated. Here's the uh, menu uh, ERD. So we can take a look at this in a little more detail. We know we have our, our table name, we have our primary key, and we have a foreign key, and we have our data types with nullability. We also have our company as a foreign key. And then when we run this through Gemini ProVision, it's able to generate our schema, our table, and it also generates meaningful descriptions. So this is quite important. So if you're doing uh, more Gen AI to author SQL statements, it's very good to have business-like descriptions inside your table. So when users uh, go ahead and do SQL creation, they could use the business terms and don't have to reference complex field names. And then we have our company table. And then we can see we add our primary keys here and actually generate the foreign key relationship. So in summary, Gem, Gem, uh, Gen AI really helped us with our, our work processes. It, we 
allowed us to do a lot of brainstorming techniques. We were able to generate all of our data synthetically. We were able to scale that. Our unstructured data could be processed in meaningful fashions. And we even created our documentation using Gen AI. And then as Be Data Beans as a whole, um, our goal is to develop a business so we can show that Gen AI could solve real world problems. And here we're solving a bunch of problems with event planning, weather, and all types of uh, goodness. So um, let us know what you think. And I'm going to hand it over to Lewis. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Adam. Um, Luis here. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good day, afternoon, evening, depending on where you guys are. I see we have people live from India. I see we have people live from San Francisco, from Washington. So hi, everyone. And thank you very much for, for joining us today. So now uh, we will delve into the complexities of the image generation pipeline for social media reviews that you may have seen on the database application. We have a, a bunch of uh, synthetic generation, synthetic generated uh, uh, social media reviews. And we're going to see exactly how we build out those images. But perhaps most importantly, we will focus on the unique challenge when scaling out this process with enterprise quality guarantees. And we show you how to overcome some of this challenge with the help of Google Cloud. My primary focus will be on images, as is the most comprehensive modality. But keep in mind that many of the concepts we will discuss are equally applicable to other media formats, like the one we, we use on DataBeans, like uh, audios or, or even videos. So motivation is, see, um, while generating a single image, and let's say from Vertex AI Studio, might seem straightforward. You go, you put the prompt, you get the image back. Producing thousands of them on a consistent basis introduce unforeseen new hurdles. And that is exactly what I want to focus and, and, and cover today. So um, the objective of the, of the pipeline uh, is, is, as I said, uh, generate more than 8,000 images that can easily accompany a social media post. Uh, here you can see some of the results that we got back after running the process. You can see, you know, results are, are pretty good. Image looks realistic. You know, you can easily find that in, in whatever uh, social media you, you, you prefer. Um, so yeah, let's let's actually um, break down our six-step image generation pipeline. First, number one, we have the automated prompt generation, where we systematically refine prompts for optimal results. So you know we don't have to keep asking ourselves, is this the best possible prompt? Next, uh, we use Imagen2, uh, which is our latest and most capable image generation model to translate that, Im that prompt that we have from step number one into actual images. And, and now we, we include a few more steps to mitigate potential problems that might pop up. We employ a face quality checks uh, to ensure the realism and clarity of generated faces followed by text quality checks to safeguard against potential problems. And we also have a copyright protection step to detect and mitigate the inclusion of unauthorized logos, for instance. Finally, in the last step, step number six, um, we experiment using imaging painting technique for modifying the images to accurately reflect desired products or elements into the original image. All right, so let's get a closer look at this process, starting with the automated prompt generation. Manually crafting prompts can seem to work initially. But as you scale this process, you might end up with images that are not what you were looking for. Maybe it's the composition, the lighting, or even the subject not looking at the camera. On the, left hand, on the left hand side of your screen, you can see an image generated by a manual prompt. On the right hand side, you can see some images generated by the automated prompts. Our process somehow learned that it's better to center the subject in the middle of the, of the, of the photo, the picture, and blur with the background for optimal results. 
So for, for achieving that, uh, we use a very simple um, evolutionary algorithm to craft the perfect proper apps. But, you know, I'll, I'll go super fast because this is actually has a bit more complexity into in, in, in it, but it's really, you know, here, here is how it works more or less. So it all start with Imagine2 um, generating the images based on the on some seed prompts. Then we use Gemini Vision to rate the image on a scale of, let's say, 0 to 100. We supply some good, bad examples in the form of images for Gemini to do in context learning. Remember, and this is important, remember that Gemini is multimodal. Then we apply a survival rate, keeping the images with the highest scores. And finally, Gemini combines pairs of prompts and introduce mutation from a database of potential chains. Those chains may be something like 4K resolution, HK resolution, like, you know, bare, bare view camera, looking at the camera, blurry background. We got like a long list of those ones. So this process is repeated until we have one winning prompt. That will be our golden prompt, so to speak. Diversity is key. So we use multiple base prompts to generate a wider range of final image types. And something interesting to note is that we benchmark the results of Gemini provision, I mean, this kind of rank scorer process versus a custom built image classifier using deep learning and see results are really, really similar. Moving on, uh, let's talk about quality assurance. So the Vision API OCR scans now each image for extracting blocks of text. And then we call Gemini with a prompt like, hey, Gemini, does this word we extract from the image make sense in this context? Reply yes or no. We parse the output, and then we can discard some of those images. In the next step, we perform a similar check, but this time for detecting logos. We simply run each image via Vertex AI visual logo detector for scanning potential copyright logos. And finally, we realized that, you know, the coffee product on the image were not necessarily the ones showing in the other table. For example, someone might be holding a large, you know, coffee cup where the actual purchase we got on the database was espresso. So instead of you know, appending the actual product to the image generation prompt, which is, you know, a very valid technique. We experiment with imaging painting using open source models. So here, here is how it works. So, so, so first we run an object detector condition on text. Uh, in this case, we condition the detection to words like beverage or, or coffee. So uh, when we have the bounding box around the item, so, you know, the coffee cup in this case, we did a fine segmentation using a, sem a, a semantic segmentation model to extract the perimeter of the product. And for instance, you know, not wiping out details like, like the hands or other background details. And, and finally, we ran a mask diffusion model providing the pro providing in the prompt the, the, the actual item to impaint. In this example you see on the screen, we were able to change this coffee cup for a nice cappuccino. All right, so this concludes the explanation of the image generation uh, pipeline, uh, where I hope you, you see how, you know, how, is, how easily we can orchestrate many different models like, you know, image generation, uh, Gem, Gemini, Gemini multimodal, or even pre-trained APIs like logo or tech detector. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. I'll now hand it over to Navia. Thank you, Luis. Uh, great way to in improve the quality of your images and using the Google technology uh, along with open source model. OK, so with that, uh, we'll go on resources and what's next. Uh, so based on what you saw today, and if you now want a more and or you want to implement it within your organization, we would recommend to contact your account team um, uh, to, to go further in these technologies. 
Uh, if you don't have an account team, uh, you can directly contact sales um, using one of the con uh, contact form available on, on our Google Cloud website. And there are several other ways to engage with the community also. So we, we have those URLs, uh, how, how to join, learn, and engage within the Google Cloud community with, uh, with the folks with the like-minded uh, and, and, and using our technology. Um, and then uh, we would love to hear uh, what you think about these sessions and um, if you have any questions and how what do you want to see in your future session so if, uh, if if you can take a little bit of time and fill out the feedback form um, we also have several sessions lined up for next uh, two to three weeks uh, ranging on wide range of topics um, like going deep into rag or connecting LLMs to real-time data, and also some of the vertical industry um, uh, on, on healthcare and science. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, you can see the list of those events on our uh, Google Cloud Community Events page. Um, so with that, we'll move to the questions now. Uh, first, uh, we got some uh, questions uh, on, the, on the registration page, so we're gonna go through all of those questions. And once we are done with those, we can take live questions. Uh, we see a couple of questions popping up in the in the live feed. Uh, so with that, the first question, uh, which was pre-submitted, um, how can you overlay using compute with multiple fine-tuned LLMs with the more traditional stack of serverless microservices? Um, this is a great question as uh, we are embedding LLMs into uh, our applications. Uh, uh, so. Luis, you want to take this question? Yeah, can take that one. So, um, reality is that you know a, a lot of the burden of managing infrastructure, those models are taken from you uh, because you know a lot of those models are hosted by us, and we provide just an API that that you just can call. So, so reality again is that you know you, you can combine multiples, e even fine tune as well uh, LLMs. You know uh, we will get that compute managed for you. However, um, we introduced recently a new capability in Vertex AI. It's called also model co-hosting. So a single node can host more than one model now. I think that's in uh, in in preview. Uh, you can check documentation for more details. Thank you, Luis. Uh, let's go to the next question. How much of ETL functions can be done through prompts? Yeah, as, as Genia is being embedded into uh, several areas, uh, so this is also the topic uh, we have seen with our customers. Adam, you want to take that one? Sure. So we've seen a lot of new creative ideas for ETL being done through prompts. Uh, one thing we let's see a lot of things is like address parsing. Uh, you'll get an address that has to be broken apart into you know six or seven different fields or normalized. So people are using that because addresses come in in all types of formats, character strings, single lines, multiple lines. So we do see a lot of that ETL functions happening at unstructured data level. We also see customers who have old XML using uh, prompts to transform that into JSON so they don't have to change certain downstream services. So they're still um keeping their older code their technical debt they're using prompts to then turn that into uh, more modern standards so we see those techniques but a lot of the stuff we do um inside of the data beans app specifically we use um, some etl techniques there to transform that data a lot of times we would get the data out of our uh, llm as json and then we can store that directly inside of our database and then the other part of this question is if you're doing this at scale if you want to run this at high speed, you're probably not going to be calling a series of LLMs if you're getting millions of rows per second. And that's where you, you spend the time to create a prompt. And that actually writes the source code that you then deploy that to, a, let's say, a streaming service. So a couple of techniques we see is um, the people doing it in inline ETL. And then we have customers writing uh, prompts to actually generate the source code to then deploy as a scalable unit. Thank you, Adam. Okay, so the next question is at the moment, my question still revolves around how can we streamline the resources and make things accessible and less overwhelming for aspiring developers, given the large and complex learning curve, which is likely to generate confusion with the young dev looking to learn. Yeah, so the developer productivity is, is definitely a, a, a 
a, a big topic on this. Uh, Firat, do you want to take this one? Yes, let me do that. Thanks, Najat, and thanks for the question. So the, the bottom line is stuff like, you know, Gemini for Google Cloud or previously known as Duet AI allows you to do that, right? So you can use that capabilities directly through, you know, while you are developing through your console and it will have the understanding on, you know, the semantics as well, right? We are seeing lots of lot of folks using that. For example, when I develop code now, that's how I start. I get my first example through that. So it helps me to get, you know, uh, get faster, quicker. But even if you are a new, you know, a new developer, you can, you know, use that to get things uh, really going much quicker as well. For example, you can go and ask and say that, how I can write a Hello World application in Python? Right, and it will give you that, and you can start building around that, or you can go further, right? So you can say that, how can I uh, do a stream, use the streaming API uh, into BigQuery from you know a data flow, right? And it will give you that code as well, right? So it will have that context, particularly you know if you are using uh, Gemini for Google Cloud, it, it it is trained on some of the knowledge as well. Thank you. Thank you, Piran. So the next question is, how do you improve lead time for data ingestion? Today, the industry works with spreadsheet whose templates change all of the time. This requires manual intervention from engineers breaking pipelines and data time. This is a great question. Uh, so we see this kind of uh, um, like setup where data is coming through and suddenly the source schema changes, which can uh, lead to disruption in the pipeline. Um, there are ways uh, we, we have seen uh, customer implementing those pipeline. Um, some of our tool, for an example, data stream uh, connects to several relational databases to get data from relational databases to BigQuery or and then and some of the other target uh, um, data sources. So some of these tool automatically handles that um, uh, schema evolution or schema changes. But if if you're not using those out of the box tools. Um, Obviously, you would need to build a system to which which perform checks and balances on the source schema and make changes if there are any changes on periodic basis on the target schema. And in the meantime, if there is any data, maybe writing it to some uh, some sync which you can rerun it or or, or maybe reprocess it. So this is definitely uh, uh, a topic where where we have. Uh, customers solving it using out of the box solution as well as building the the the, the solution for schema evolution uh firat or anyone from 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 the team would like to add to this one so you know one of the things that you know you see the traditional detail is that what happens is uh that you know imagine that you are doing cdc coming from a uh, data warehouse or a database. So you look into that, you, you look into where, where the schema might change, right? Or whether the data that is coming through, you know, fitting into the schema and you put the, you know, uh, the guardrails around that using the ETL code, right? But also uh, with the, you know, uh, with the use of the LLMs, right? You can uh, use, uh, for example, LLMs to look into the, the headers or data types or, you know, sample roles. Uh, roles, right? So it can also, you know, understand the schema. Adam talked around that at the beginning, that all the schema and everything is created through that, including all the, you know, data models. So you can build, uh, you know, effectively the ETL pipelines through that as well. In fact, I've seen, you know, folks using that, not for this, you know, use case, but use cases such as converting from XML into JSON, right? You know, just using the uh, LLMs as well. So you know, you can use traditional techniques, but you can also use uh, the new generative AI techniques as well. Thank you for adding to that, Farad. So uh, next question, how do you improve metadata of data, set, data sets? It's hard to have governance around fields in a data warehouse. Uh, Adam, would you like to take this one? Um, sure. So what you can do, a lot of customers are look, taking their table descriptions, like you saw when I passed in the ERD, and they're taking their business terms with Gen AI, and they're updating their table descriptions and their column descriptions to include that. 
So that's helping them uh, tag or add human readable descriptions. So if you're doing uh, SQL or your you know, SQL completion or type uh, prompt and you get a SQL statement, you can use your, your business terms to go ahead and do that. And then uh, having governance around your data warehouse. Um, with BigQuery, we have a unified way, whether the table is a internal table, an external table, like a big lake table, we call them, or even if it's a, a managed iceberg table, we, we can put governance around um, those tables in the same fashion for different types of security. And then we also have integration into a product called Dataplex that will help you discover and look at that different metadata. Brock, did you have anything to add or Louis? So it is all about, you know, uh, having that context within the, you know, uh, within your metadata system as well. You can use, for example, your operational uh, metadata to augment your business metadata. You can, you know, operationalize that much easily, you know, with, uh, with LLMs as well, right? It, it can also help you because you can, one of the things that you can do is you can understand, it will understand the code for you. So it will help you also to, you know, write that metadata for you as well because it will also be able to understand what's that, what you have in the schema. Thank you, Firad and Adam. Um, so I think we are at the end on the pre-submitted question. We are gonna pull up a few of the questions from the from the live feed. Uh, one of the question uh, from Dawi was, is it possible to integrate this AI with BigQuery with AppSheet? Uh, yes, and AppSheet has a integration with BigQuery. You can read BigQuery data within AppSheet. Um, I think there are two kind of connectors. One is wire connector sheet, and one is out of the box available inside app sheet, uh, depending on your uh, tier of the app sheet you're using. So you can choose uh, um, uh, the, the connector you would like to. So in terms of AI, if you are if you're calling LLMs or, or building models in a BigQuery, you can store those results in a BigQuery and then surface in app sheet. And AppSheet also has Webhooks API, which can trigger workflows um, uh, using an API as most of the LLMs and and um, and our AI platform, Vertex AI, is also API driven. So, so, so you you can use that uh, AppSheet Webhook API also to to connect to Vertex AI. Um, I hope that answers this question. Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, do we have any other questions from the live feed? Any regions, restrictions, anything not available globally? Um, so do you want to answer that? So uh, I, I recommend looking into the, you know, uh, our documentation and our release notes. We are continuously updating this, right? So I don't know on top of my head what is available. Uh, at the moment on where, but, you know, we keep track of these on our documentation. So I would recommend looking into that. Thank you, Pira. Uh, will you share the collabs? Um, Pira, do you want to take this one? Yeah, why not? So uh, th that's a good idea. So, we, you know, uh, we'll look into, you know, making that high level as well. Uh, let's see what we can do about that. Okay, I think we have one more question. So will Dataplex benefit from embed LLMs, Gemini capabilities to streamline data governance? Yes, indeed, and, and watch the space. So we already have some capabilities and, you know, I, I recommend, uh, you know, uh, joining to uh, Next24, which is coming up, you know, around the corner. Yeah, we'll be announcing a lot of uh, new, new exciting integration and features. So we, we would definitely recommend to to watch out uh, for the announcement during next. I think with that, we are uh, towards the top of the hour. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, please feel free to submit the feedback and also uh, join our Google Cloud community events to join any future events. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.